who is Rakovsky? What we're going to talk about here is the Rakovsky interview. Uh, Rakovsky is a name probably unknown to almost everyone here. He was one of the key founders of communism. You know, it's kind of like the Clinton administration or the Reagan administration. You know the top guy. You maybe don't know too many people that were helpers. And Rakovsky was one of the key uh, founders of communism. Uh, we read here from a book put together by Deidre Manifold, the Irish uh, scholar, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, she received some, a boost in editing and, and a little augmentation from someone who I believe is a speaker here, uh, Cornelia R. Ferrara, and they, the book is called Towards World Government, New World Order, and much of this research we are just gleaning from the work of, uh, of, of these two ladies, uh, and some of the rest of it is the actual interview we'll refer to. But here's what they quote Trotsky. Leon Trotsky was the one, like the third, and you had Lenin in 1917 when communism took over Russia. He had Stalin in 1922. And Trotsky was one of the very top key people with those two. Trotsky actually was trying to take over Russia in 1922, as we'll find out. Here's what Trotsky said about Christian Rakovsky. Christian G. Rakovsky is internationally one of the best known figures in the European socialist movement, he tells us. A Bulgarian by birth, he is a was a Romanian subject by the dint of the Balkan map, a French physician by education, a Russian by connections, his by his sympathies and literary work. He speaks all the languages and so on and so forth, and he makes clear that he was one of the leaders of the Soviet Federation, a founder of the Communist Internationale. In other words, this fellow was a real insider. Now, if you do not believe that there is a, a coherent coalition of people, organizations, attempting to consolidate world government, you're just going to have to do like they do in the movies and give a willing suspension of disbelief here. After study, I don't think too many people who study this doubt that there is such a group. Rakovsky is obviously, as we'll see, one of those insiders. And what was happening at this point, so keep him in mind, and I'll kind of refer to what each person is, because there's only a few, but these names get a little confusing when you're first hearing them. And what was happening was is that the bankers who funded Lenin, who funded the revolutionary movements beginning back in the 18th century, which, which we'll refer to here, the bankers uh, would fund somebody up the line sometimes, and sometimes the guy they funded up the line would say at one point, hey, I control the armies, why do I need these guys? And Stalin was such a man. Stalin at one point thought, I'm not going with the program anymore. I'm going to go my own route. And uh, uh, Hitler was another such fellow, as we'll find out. This is like a bunch of thieves fighting with each other with their guns drawn e on each other, and millions of people get ca caught in the crossfire. So uh, Stalin, uh, it, he, he realized, he, just like maybe just without realizing why, that many of the international people, like this guy who's from all over the Europe and really not a Russian to start with, a lot of the people who had been sent in by the bankers' men were, were working against him. So a, a fight broke out between the local thugs, Stalin's people, and the international thugs, of which Rakovsky was one of that circle. And Stalin purged in 1938, many of you may have heard of this, he purged a lot of his enemies. It was called the show trials of 1938. So here we are in 1938 and he's purging his enemies. Rakovsky is one of the guys, one of 21 key conspirators against Stalin that are put on trial, the show trials worldwide. So that's Rakovsky. And Rakovsky says one, as he's getting near to be his, his death, in fact he was scheduled to be executed the next day, and he basically was saying for a long time and he said again this day, if you talk to me tonight, you will not kill me in the morning. So Stalin's top interrogator, a fellow named Guzman, Gabriel Guzman, all these fellows have Christian names, but none of them are Christians, as they make clear themselves, that they absolutely despise Christianity. But for cover, the, you know, they pick names. One of the a, a communists, they said, pick the cover name O'Reilly. You know, a lot of cover names, but, the, but it's, in, it's in the interview. But so Guzman gets permission from, Stalin isn't going to waste time, but he gives Guzman permission to interview the guy. And then the third character, so you got Rakovsky's the, uh, the uh, international banker guy that, that Stalin's mad at. Kuzman's the interviewer. And Landowski is the a Polish doctor who's been Russianized. Uh, his dad, you know, w came to Russia from Poland. And he's a Polish doctor who is unwillingly held captive by Stalin because he's such a good translator. And uh, 
Kuzmin, uh, this, this fellow Landowski is, is forced to watch a lot of tortures in Stalin's interrogation room, which is an actual building set up for interrogations. He's got to tape it and do the translations. So he tries to get out of this. But Landowski is the third character we got in this interview. So Rakovsky, the guy who's going to be killed the next morning, and says, talk to me tonight. You will not kill me in the morning. Guzman, who's Stalin's chief interrogator and henchman in this regard. And Landowski is the doctor who they're forcing to, to be present and, and do the interview. And uh, the interview is why to save, from Rakovsky's point of view, to try to save his life. From Stalin's point of view, maybe we're going to get something that will be useful here. Stalin feels under siege. He notices that a lot of things are moving against him because he's having a fight with the people that started funding him up the ladder and, and his group up the ladder. How was this interview preserved? This doctor, as he makes clear at the end, he said, when I left the meeting that night, in effect, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, but he says, I felt like a child and the adults had pulled back the curtain so I could see how the world really works. And he realized when he was, they taped it in French because the people involved could speak French better. He had to go back and tape, type it up and, and, and translate it into Russian. And he made a copy for Stalin and a copy for Guzman, which was what he was supposed to do. He, since he was alone in a prison cell, he also made a third carbon copy for himself because he realized how important it was. Put it up in the legs of the chair, uh, legs of the table, like the hollow legs. And when the war was over and he was free, he took it with him. From that point on, he was actually killed while trying to get out of Russia near the end of the war, but he entrusted it, or it was picked up by a Spanish soldier who was there. He brought it to Spain, and a famous author among this type of writing, uh, George Knupfer, K-N-U-P-F-F-E-R, George Knupfer, who was Russian Orthodox, I believe, heard about this and tracked it down and took years, uh, 12 years to get it into print. And this book about this interview, word for word, has been out. It's called Red Symphony. I don't know if you can find it or not, but it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it has been in print through Omni Books and other book clubs over the years, but called Red Symphony, if you can ever tr track it down. It's only 56 pages. It's so interesting, though, with the schedule I have to keep. It's one of the few books in the last 10 years that I read very slow, word for word, because there's so much packed into it. So that's how it was preserved. Um, one interesting point I would make here is that never in the book, nor with George Knupfer being Russian Orthodox, he was one, somebody who fled Russia when the communists took over, uh, Landowski being in captivity, uh, probably never having heard of Fatima. Uh, many people didn't even hear of Fatima until the movie, ironically enough, in Hollywood came out in around 1952 or so. A very, no indication whatsoever that any of these people could care less about Our Lady of Fatima, even know about Our Lady of Fatima, certainly aren't trying to make uh, her credibility rise or fall. They just didn't seem to have any, any concern about it. So that's the setting we have here. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to do is go through some of the concepts that are covered in this interview while I have time. I'm going to do this until my time starts to get to the point where I have to get to the main thing that was said at the end in the punchline. But it's, it's somewhat instructive that we might do this for the sake of uh, you getting a feel for what was going on. First of all, uh, at the beginning of the... Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the book, the first thing that Dr. Landowski, the translator, did was give a, a feeling for what was going on. He called his, his chapter here, X-ray of revolution. He felt like he had an X-ray machine after listening to this that, uh, that gave him a ability for the first time, like an X-ray machine can see your bones, to see what the revolution was really about. Uh, he, this little feeling for Dr. Landowski and what he had to go through, because he was taken away from his family in the middle of the night by the KGB, kept captivity for 1938 at least till 1945, maybe before 38. I returned to my laboratory. This is before the interview. My nervous system bothered me, and I prescribed myself complete rest. I am in bed almost the whole day. There I am quite alone for already four days. Gabriel inquired, Gabriel is Guzman, the one that's gonna, Stalin's man, inquired about me every day. He was to reckon with my condition. At the mere thought that they could again send me to the Lubyanka, which is Moscow headquarters of the secret police, to be present at a new scene of terror, I become excited and tremble. I am ashamed of belonging to the human race. How low people have fallen. How low I have fallen. Of course, he was forced to be in the situation. Um, he then uh, describes the scene with, uh, he sees Rakovsky, he's got to make sure his health is okay. He's to feed him some drugs 
like alcohol and a few other things during the talk to make sure he feels happy and loosened up and wants to talk. Of course, remember, he's trying to save his life as well. And uh, he talks about the preparation of the room, and uh, he, when, he get, when, he, when he sees what it's going to be, he sees this is not going to be a torture session, very warm fire, uh, nice heated room. I, the uh, uh, Guzman comes in and says, ah, just like a meeting for lovers. So they're no, not trying to torture this guy now. They have tortured him in the past. But they now want to see if you really can give him any information. Um, he, he describes Rakovsky as being a man about 50. He said probably not a bad-looking man in his, his younger days. He says this, he says, uh, I sat down and asked the prisoner to sit. He went to a cell. He was about 50 years old. He was a man of median height, bald in front with a large fleshy nose. In youth, his face was probably pleasant. His fa facial outlines were not typically Semitic, but his origin was nevertheless clear. Once upon a time, he was probably quite fat, but not now. And his skin hung everywhere, while his face and neck were like a burst balloon with the air let out. The usual dinner at the Lubyanka was apparently too strict a diet for the former ambassador to, in Paris. This was a very cultured man, could speak five languages, was an ambassador. Now he's on bread and water or whatever they were feeding him in prison. At the moment, I made no further observations. So that gives you a little fear there for, a feel there for Rakovsky. Um, some of the things that they covered in the uh, talk, they start out the interview uh, with uh, uh, Gusman, the interrogator, saying, are you Hitler's spies? Remember now, they got these guys on trial because they're, Stalin feels he's threatened by them. And uh, Rakovsky says, yes. Uh, and Gusman says, no, no, Rakovsky, no. He says, tell the real truth, not the court proceeding ones. Here's two revolutionaries, communists, talking to each other. They say, don't tell the truth that we would tell before the public in the court proceedings. I want the real truth here. He says, Rakovsky says, we are not spies of Hitler. We hate Hitler as you can hate him and as Stalin can hate him, perhaps even more so and so forth. And numerous times, three or four times in this interview, he says, look, he says, uh, here, in fact, right here, he says, therefore, whatever may be your words here, they cannot make your position worse. You must know that they will not worsen your crime, but on the contrary, they can give the desired results in your favor. You will be able to save your life, which at this moment is already lost. In other words, he's saying, you're going to be killed in the morning, so try to save yourself here. You can't make it worse, but you better, beg, you better tell us something good. So now I have told you this, let's get started. Then he asks him this, this thing here. And um, Rakovsky makes it clear right away in the interview that he's well-connected. He says, were you doing, you, but you were in touch with Hitler's secret police. He says, yes. What did you do it for money? He says, Rakovsky says, for money, no, nobody received a single mark from Germany. Hitler was not, has not enough money to buy us. For example, the Commissar of Foreign Affairs here in the USSR, who has at his disposal freely a budget which is greater than the total wealth of Morgan and Vanderbilt, and who doesn't even have to count for the money. So in other words, he says, Certainly we're not doing it for the money. So then he gets into why, why are they doing it. Um, on page 15, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights here because we have the time. And very important what he says. He, he gives so many secrets away. It's like it, this is the closest thing to having someone confess on the inside that it's ever been put out. And uh, one of the things he says here on uh, page 15 is, that uh, he asked him about Karl Marx. He says, do you not, uh, Gusman, the interrogator says, do you not want to open up to me the mystical Marxism, something like yet another Freemasonry? And Rakovsky says, on the contrary, I, ex I shall explain it with the maximum clarity. Marxism, before being a philosophy, economic or political system, is a conspiracy for the revolution. And he makes clear here that Marx did not, did deliberately obscured many things. Excuse me. He did deliberately obscured many things because primarily Marxism is a conspiracy, and Marx knew this, and uh, he he put this philosophy around it to give it a uh, give it a credibility. Um, what one of the most important things he makes clear in this uh, in this interview is that the bankers at the top of capitalism and communism are in in league with each other. Um, here, here's where he, he hints closest to where his connections are, although he pretends that he does not know any of these individuals. But by reading the thing, you, you wonder if he really must not know them. He says, in the question of money, Marx is a reactionary. To one's immense surprise, 
uh, he was one. Bear in mind the five-pointed star like the Soviet one, which shines all over Europe. The star composed of the five Rothschild brothers with their banks, who possess colossal accommodation of wealth, the greatest ever known. And so this, in the fact, so colossal that it misled the imagination of the people of that epoch, passes unnoticed with Marx. Something strange, is it not so? In other words, he's saying Marx is a brilliant guy, which he was. He says he doesn't pretend in his writings to ever notice these bankers in the background funding everything. Something strange, is that not so? Is it possible that from this strange blindness of Marx, in other words, deliberate blindness of Marx in his writings, there arises a phenomenon which is common to all future social revolutions? It is this. We can all confirm that when the masses take possession of a city or a country, this is like the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Spanish Revolution in 1936 where the communists tried to take over, and this is very interesting what he says, they always seem struck themselves by a sort of superstitious fear of the banks and bankers. One has killed, the revolutions have killed kings, generals, bishops, policemen, pr policemen priests, and other representatives of the hated privileged classes. One robbed and burned palaces, churches, and even centers of science. But though the revolutions were economical, social, the lives of the bankers were respected. And as a result, the magnificent buildings of the banks remained untouched, which is true in every revolution. According to my information, this is also true in the recent Spanish Revolution where the communists tried to take over Spain two years ago. Now, he gets into the real goal of the revolution. Uh, he talks, he talks about the communist capital, capitalist international. In other words, uh, Pope Pius XI talked about this same thing in 1931. He said extreme uh, capitalism, or Pat Buchanan once referred to this as vulture capitalism in one of his columns, and of course he immediately got jumped on, but extreme capitalism and communism lead to the same place. The church's position has always been a limited capitalism, respecting the freedom of of uh, free enterprise of, the, of, of all individuals, but not allowing the most ruthless cutthroats to grab control of the economy, which we have happening today all over the world, and I'll, I'll try to tie in today. If not, I'll tie it in in my talk tomorrow morning, if we, if we run out of time here. Uh, here in one of his answers, uh, Rakovsky says, the financier is just as international as the communist, both with the help of uh, differing pretexts and different means struggle with the national bourgeois state and deny it. In other words, both are trying to overthrow the state. Uh, he gets into the real goal of the revolution then, uh, which uh, he says, as they th overthrew the king, for instance, in the Fresh French Revolution, the people uh, did not seem to notice that the possession of the real royal power, the magical power, almost divine, which is obtained almost without anyone knowing it. The masses did not notice that the power had been seized by others, and soon they were subjected to a slavery more cruel than that of the king, since the latter, the king, in view of his religion and moral prejudices, was incapable of taking full advantage of such a power. So it came about that the supreme royal power was taken over by persons whose moral, intellectual, and cosmopolitan qualities did allow them to use it. Cosmopolitan is often a code word here for the communist revolution and, and the bankers' funding it. It is clear that this were people who had never been Christians but cosmopolitan. In other words, the, the people running the revolution. Comes out right and say it, right, right there and says it. Um, and he gets into the magic of checkbook money. Now this, is, now this is 1938. Imagine how much further this is along today. Even though to some extent it's a natural evolution, and I'll try to explain something here about economics that most of the conservatives and right wing in, in the world don't seem to understand. He says uh, about money, he says, uh, the, the, the interrogator, Guzman, listening to this, who's obviously not nearly as sophisticated as Rakovsky is, he says, this is a brilliant paradox and risky, even poetical, regarding how money has become so powerful in the revolution. He says, if you like, uh, Rakovsky says, this is perhaps brilliant, but it is not a paradox. I know, and that is why you, you smiled, that states still coin money, pieces of metal and paper, with royal busts or national crest. He's ridiculing now here the money that we all carry around. He says, well, so what? A great part of the money circulating now for big affairs as representative of all national wealth, wealth, money, yes, money, it was being issued by these few people whom I have hinted. In other words, the bankers, who he starts calling they and them throughout the interview because uh, uh, the interrogator says, who are they? So he just starts referring to them as they. He says, titles, figures, checks, promissory notes, endorsements, discounts, quotations, figures without end, flooded states like a waterfall. 
today we can say debit cards, credit cards. And the secret here is that, as you may know, in 1930 in the United States and all over the world around the turn of this century, private companies were given the power to issue money by the governments. It happened in 1913 in the, in the United States. Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, works for a private company contracted with by the go government. Federal Reserve's never been audited. There's a book out called All These Things by a Mr. A. N. Field, 1930, where he says, what's, you know, he kind of says, look, all over the world they're establishing private companies to issue the state's money, which is not good, especially when you can't see what they're doing, which is the way it's been. And he's saying here, now this checkbook money, or this, these figures, which now today are racing all over the world by computer, this is the real money now, or this is most of the money. And these, the, the, uh, uh, coins and the dollars are almost outdated. And he talks about the magic of this money and by how issuing this money and charging interest to the nations is what has given this small group of people their power. And this is absolutely true. It's been written out from many angles. But when, when in the United States, and here too, I'm sure, when the government asks for money in this private company, the Federal Reserve in the United States, gives the money to the Congress or to the people, then they start charging its interest right away. Boom, boom, boom. So the more rich the country becomes, the more in debt we are, because you have to have money to make things happen. So the more, uh, the, you know, the more TVs and cars and everything we get, the more we're in debt. And that's happened all over the world. That's why we have these absurd debts. And we'll be getting into the solution of these things tomorrow. This is no, no reason to get demoralized. All this could be fixed uh, in a matter of hours if, if you had the courage of, of the Congress and the president, uh, uh, if you had a good president, but if you had the courage of leaders in, 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 a, in a, a country to fix it. So he talks about this very important aspect of money. Um, let's see, we want to, I want to make sure to cover the most important points in this interview now. We get into page 28. He talks something very interesting here about false opposition. And he says this, false opposition. Has anyone ever heard that term before? This is where you pretend you're fighting for something, but you're going to throw the game, kind of like big time wrestling. One guy is going to throw the fight. They're, hang on, and I would not get in there with any of these wrestlers. They really are hitting each other. They're really cutting each other. They're breaking their bones sometimes, but they know before it's over who is going to win. It's scripted out, and they admit this now openly. Everyone knew it for years, but even the kids now hear them admit that this is basically entertainment. Well, there's false opposition in the real world, too, and he talks about when Lenin took over. Uh, first of all, you had to get the czar was, you know, the czar was attacked, and incidentally, he was attacked. Uh, so easily because Stalin and Lenin, and the, uh, not Lenin, but Stalin and Trotsky and many of the rest of these people either themselves or had their key people in the Tsar's secret police supposedly protecting the Tsar. So when it came time that they got the money and the word, they were able to easily overthrow, you know, it's like having the Secret Service overthrow a president or something is what happened to the Tsar in 1917. But to not shock the people, they had a man named Kerensky take over the government and proclaim a republic for a few months, I think it was. And then Kerensky handed it over to Lenin, who became the dictator, the first communist dictator. And uh, here's what Rakovsky says about that. He says, but this is not yet all. Kerensky was to pro provoke the future advance at the cost of a very great deal of blood. He brings it about so that the democratic revolution should spread beyond its bounds. And even still more, Kerensky was to surrender the state fully to communism. And he does it. In other words, he surrenders Russia fully to Lenin. Trotsky has the chance in an unnoticed manner, quote unquote, to occupy the whole state apparatus. What a strange blindness. Well, that is the reality of the much praised October Revolution. The Bolsheviks took, Bolsheviks, Vicks, took that which they, the bankers, gave them and funded them to take. Uh, then Guzman, kind of a little bit shocked here, says, you dare to say that Kerensky was a collaborator of Lenin? Rakovsky, oh Lenin, no, of Trotsky. It was Trotsky who was the connection between the bankers and the, and the revolution. Yes, it is more correct to say a collaborator of them, in other words, of those funding it. Gu Guzman says, an absurdity. And Rakovsky says, you cannot understand it. Precisely you, it surprises me, you being a spy. And he goes on to say, uh, he's, he goes on to say, yes, uh, to me this is clear, that Kerensky was a conscious and voluntary defeatist, meaning he was planning to lose. Understand that I personally took part in all this. I shall tell you even more. Do you know the, who, who financed the October Revolution? And he gets into the financing for the United States. But he finally says that when the history of this period is written, Kerensky will be given more credit than Lenin 
for the fall of, of Russia. In other words, the guy who pretended he was, was on the side of the Russians and handed it over to the communists was more valuable to them than Lenin, who at the time just took it over. This concept of false opposition is being used over and over and over again against us, and especially being from the United States. George W. Bush uh, is an example. Um, John McCain, we could go over and over the leaders that are put up and given great publicity by the media and treated very kindly, that they are false opposition. We, we, we could go into that. That's a whole other speech. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit tomorrow. Um, now, we, before I get to the punchline here, I have to tell you about uh, what he says about Freemasonry, and then we're going to get into the punchline here. I believe I have 15 minutes left, but I'm not totally positive of that. So... Uh, Here's what he says about Freemasonry, and this is extremely interesting, because here's a guy who really knows what's going on. Now, in America, we have gigantic Freemason buildings all over the place. And I notice as I travel, don't travel much, but as I traveled in different states, you see all over the place you'll see little Freemasonic signs put up almost, not too big, but it's almost like they're official street signs or something. They're very, so you wonder what's going on here. And, of course, there's been billions of dollars put into making Freemasonry plush, the places the insides of one of the places plush. I was in a Shackley convention, vitamin convention, 1978, just by chance was in one of these places, incredibly wealthy carpets and in the middle of miniature uh, Temple of Solomon, just like you, you, we've read about, about Freemasonry. So, but what's going on here? And Kerensky tells us what's going on here in no uncertain terms. He says, you forget, and he's trying to figure out how did Kerensky and how do some of these false opposition leaders do what they do, do so effectively. And Rakovsky says, you forget about the role of Freemasonry in the first phase of the Democratic Democratic bourgeois resolution, a uh, revolution. Uh, and Guzman says, were they also controlled by the Bund? Uh, Rakovsky says, naturally is the nearest step, but in fact they were subject to them, the financiers, of course. Because, for instance, if I, if I had the power of our Alan Greenspan, all of us could go home with $10 million in the bank so we could have our own little Catholic cells all over the United States. You understand how this works? This is the key thing. This is why the state's good Christian leaders, when Our Lady strikes in a Hermaculate Heart triumphs, will again control the issue of money. And we won't be faced with all this but craziness we see, such as like Patricia Allen, Ireland of now being given endless publicity. Here's a person who is not worth any publicity except to be put on trial and put in jail for advocating abortion and so forth. And she's given publicity as if she's somebody important every week by all the major media. So he's a subject to them. Despite the rising tide of Marxism, which also threatened their lives and privileges, and are you saying, isn't Marxism threatened? Three, the Freemasons. And Rukowski says, despite all that, obviously they did not see that danger. Bear in mind that every Mason saw and hoped to see in his imagination more than was in reality, because he imagined that which was profitable for him. As a proof of the political power of their association, they saw them, that Masons were in government and at the pinnacle of the states of the bourgeois, bourgeois nations. In other words, the Masons saw their own people and they'd constantly tell them, look, uh, in their lodges, there's our guys running everything. See, we're the organization to be with. Bear in mind that at the time the rulers of all the allied nations were Freemasons, such as Wilson, President Wilson, with very few exceptions. This was to them an argument of great force to the Masons. They fully believed that the revolution would stop at the bourgeoisie level, like the Republic of the French type. I guess he's referring to what, what ended up to be the French Revolution. So then he goes on, he says, uh, Guzman says, do you want to say that the Freemasons have to die at the hands of the revolution which has been brought about by their cooperation? The Freemasons are going to die by what they helped to bring about? And Rakowski says, exactly so. You have formulated a truth which is veiled by a great secret. Now Rakowski says, not to our surprise, I am a Mason. You already know about this. Everyone here, the doctor was not Masons, but everyone else involved in this scenario was, as they make clear by some of the secret signs given in court. Is that not so? Well, I shall tell you the great secret which they promise to disclose to a Mason in one of the higher degrees, but which is not disclosed to him either in the 25th degree, nor the 33rd degree, nor the 93rd degree, nor any other high level of any ritual. It is clear that I know of of this not as a Freemason, but as one who belongs to them. In other words, he knows it by the organization that controls Freemasonry. You know, in Freemasonry, they don't tell them who any of their leaders are except the next step up. 
you would think people might after a while think, especially with all those oath goes, they go through, they'd think, what kind of an organization is this? You'd think a lot of people would wonder this. So they don't, certainly, when they don't ask who their leader is to up or what they're going to be asked to do some year in the future, they just certainly don't think who runs the whole world. I've asked a number of Masons, who's your leader worldwide? And they look at you like you've asked them, uh, could you now jump and get on the moon within five minutes? I mean, they've never thought of it. So here's what he says. He's, and Guzman says, so what is it? What's the secret? Rakowski says, every Masonic organization tries to attain and to create all the required prerequisites for the triumph of the communist revolution. This is the obvious aim of free masonry. It is clear that all this is done under various pretexts, but they always conceal themselves behind their well-known slogans such as liberty, equality, fraternity. You understand. But since the communist revolution has in mind the liquidation as a class of the whole uh, ruling class, bourgeois, bourgeoisie, I'm not saying that right, the physical destruction of all politi uh, bourgeoisie political rulers, it follows that the real secret of masonry is the suicide of Freemasonry as an organization. The real secret is the suicide of its own organization and the physical suicide of every more important Mason. You can, of course, understand that such an end, which is being prepared for every Mason, fully deserves the secrecy, decorativeness, and the inclusion of yet another whole series of secrets with a view to concealing this real one. If one day you were to be present at some future revolution, such as Hungary, I, I'm throwing that in, then do not miss the opportunity of observing the gestures of surprise and the expression of stupidity of the, uh, uh, on the faces of the, some Freemasons at the moment when he realizes, of some Freemason at the moment, when he realizes that he must die at the hands of the revolutionary the revolutionaries. How he screams and wants that one should value his services to the revolution. It is a sight at which one can die, but die of laughter. Now, right there, Rakowski kind of, the demonic uh, 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 hatred kind of jumps out there when he says he just enjoyed so much seeing these Freemasons who had helped them take over executed when they expected they were being call, called to a meeting to be given positions of power. Okay, now, let's get into what happened here. And you cannot understand World War II, which he explains in this interview, without understanding that both Stalin and Hitler were local thugs trying to throw off the international thugs. That is the most important thing to uh, to keep in mind when you to understand what was happening here. And basically, to summarize, um, Rakowski says to him. So they finally get. So what's you know? Let's get to the the meat of the matter here. And he says, "We want you to." Uh, he tells Rakos uh, Guzman, "You tell Stalin to make a pact with Hitler, and it will be attractive to Hitler. You make an agreement to divide Poland." And you will see that you will get help from all over the world. Now, preceding up to this in the interview, Rakowski says, we are furious with Stalin. That's why we were planning against you. Now, remember, he's going to die in the morning, so he's not hiding anything anymore. The reason we were plotting against you is because Stalin, when he took over the revolution, and he makes it clear they wanted Trotsky. When Stalin took over the Communist Revolution, he made it a national Russian revolution more than they wanted. So they were furious with him, and they wanted to get rid of him. And what they, they looked around Europe and they said, uh, what are we going to do? None of the nations of Europe are aggressive. The only nation that has the industrial power to attack Russia eventually, this is back now like in the late 20s, uh, is, is Germany. And then Hitler, who was already kind of a, uh, a very uh, a fiery orator, as everyone knows, and, and had the, was willing to kill anyone in his path, which is always something that the, the bankers or them like, uh, he, they, 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 they decided, he tells them in this interview, they decided to fund Hitler on the way up so that he then could build up uh, uh, Germany in the hopes that, uh, that eventually that they would get this attack on Russia and take over from Stalin. And he tells how in 1929 they sent someone, the Nazis were contending with other forces, and they put millions of dollars behind Hitler to make sure he got up the ladder. It's the same as today, and I'm not making a direct comparison here, as suddenly we see a bunch of people in the field in the United States, and suddenly one day we hear George W. Bush got $35 million. Now, we know how likely that would be if it wasn't orchestrated from a lot of rich people, but they wanted to move him ahead of the, the pack, particularly ahead of Buchanan and some of the other candidates. They didn't want the social candidates to get, get the, so this is what happened in 1929 in a different sense. They, they funded Hitler up the line because they were hoping to get rid of Stalin. Then he says, but, he says, in other words, he calls Stalin, he says, Stalin is like Napoleon Bonaparte. We helped him up the line and then 
he stole the strength of the revolution. And he felt that the, these bankers felt Stalin was just keeping it to Russia and not spreading it fast enough. So he says, then he says, Hitler made us even more mad than Stalin. Hitler gets up the line and he says, Hitler also says, gee, why do I need to take money from these guys? And then he says the key thing. And in this thing, Hitler did something good. A bad guy can do something good sometimes. He said, and Rakovsky says, we don't know, in effect, we don't know who told him, but somehow he figured out how to issue money on his own. And he said, if this spreads from other, to other nations, then we will have a real problem. Because the whole power of this relatively small group is the power to issue money. So we got to get now, it's more important that we knock out Hitler than we knock out Stalin. You understand? He, he said, we cannot let people see. Now, a Catholic leader in Portugal, Salazar, understood this. But it, this is the main blindness of the Christian nations over the centuries. Incidentally, I must mention this uh, before getting to the punchline here. This is not inflationary money. This is where the, the, uh, many of the conservatives and right wing do not seem to understand what's going on in money. And a group up here in Canada, Vera's Domain, which uh, promotes a, a system called social credit, which is not socialism, it's actually Christian capitalism, has hit it on the head. When Alan Greenspan issues money now in the United States, it's, it's because there's real production of the people. There's real cars, there's real houses, there's real people, there's real resources. If they, issue, if they would issue more money than there is resources, you'd have inflation. But what gives money its value is the goods and services. If we had a pound, miles of gold here and no water or food, we'd all be dead in about two weeks or so, maybe less. So it's the products that give the money its value. As long as the money is issued in, in harmony with the products and services available, then there's no inflation. And that's what the Christian states need to do in the future when there are Christian states again and not let it fall into the hands of a bunch of cutthroat super criminals like we have here. So he says, we're even, Rakowski says, now we're even madder at Hitler than we are at Stalin. So he says, here's what we'll do. You know, now they're in a bind. They, they, it, it took them a while to get back. They got uh, rid of Stalin in 1953 through poison, I believe. But he's saying here in 1938, if you will begin to put out feelers to Hitler, and they have spies in all camps so they would know, you will find you will get help from the United States. And here he says, you'll get help from a lot of people who you think are your enemies. If you will do this thing, put out feelers for the, for the pact, and then you and Hitler eventually divide Poland. In the interview, he says it could be Czechoslovakia or Poland, but I think Hitler will be more interested in Poland. Okay, so he says, you do this. So the interviewer now, who's no dummy himself, as far, at least as far as cutthroat politics, says, well, this is all nice, Rakowski, but he says, I need something more than this. Remember, you're going to be dead in five hours or whatever it is if we don't get something concrete. So Rakowski says, okay, I must break the rules. And this is where Rakowski kind of lets you know, gee, he's pretty high up because he knows exactly what's saying. He says, you know President Roosevelt's new ambassador over here, Davis? He says, go see Davis and ask him. So that was enough, something concrete. They did not kill Rakowski in the morning. They went to see Davis, and Davis gives them the, he gives them the nod. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. If you, if you begin to do that, we'll, we can get you this aid, we can get you this aid. And so Stalin's interested, and this, this, this is what happens now. The punchline of this little talk is obviously that the idea that Rakowski threw into Guzman's head who took it to Stalin was that they have a Hitler-Stalin pact, which eventually came about, and that Pol Hitler and, P and Stalin divide Poland, invade on the same day and divide Poland. This is what happened on September 1, 1939. Okay. September 3? Oh, England declared war. But I think Hitler moved in on September 1, but you're saying England declared war on... Okay. Okay. Let's take... Let's take the date of September 3rd. It's right in that, in that few-day period, though. Excuse me if I mistook that. But, so, here, so you have a situation... Thank you for that. You have a situation where... Um, where Guzman gives, uh, excuse me, Rakowski gives Stalin's man the idea to do this at this time. Now, what was happening at this time, and this is the significance of the Rakowski interview. The Rakowski interview, as recorded by Dr. Landowski, the translator, began at midnight, January 26. When was the light happening? Between 6.30 and 9.30, the strange light predicted at Fatima was happening between 6.30 and 9.30 in Europe and America. Moscow time is three hours ahead of, uh, uh, behind um, 
excuse me, ahead, three hours ahead of European time. So when it's 9 o'clock in Europe, it's 12 o'clock in Russia, in Moscow, correct. So at the very time that light was up, had been up for two hours, at 9 o'clock in Europe, midnight, January 26 in Moscow, this interview began. When the light ended, 12.30 in Moscow time, a.m., after midnight, then it's known in this document that the serious conversation begins. So it just began, and the, the interview lasted until 6 in the morning in Moscow. So just as the serious talk was beginning that led to this idea, which started World War II, at that moment, the red light was warning the, the, was warning the world, uh, as Our Lady had said at Fatima. Um, Deidre Manifold says this, the exact timing in the questioning is significant. It took place from midnight to 6 a.m. on the night of January 25, 26, 1938. It is important to note that Moscow, uh, that, that Moscow time is three hours ahead of the Western European time. The serious questioning of Rakowski began at approximately 12.30 a.m. When the bright light shone in the sky, Sister Lucia, the Fatima seer in her convent in Spain, let it be known that this was the sign given by God and foretold by Our Lady of Fatima on July 13, 1917, that a major war would soon occur. So the, the, you might say the point of this talk is that even though we didn't know what was happening and nobody knew what was happening, as Father Gruner might say, Our Lady uh, keeps her, her promises much more precisely than we can imagine. And that's why I want to end today on a, on a, on a uh, feeling of hope. And tomorrow I will tie in the so-called death of communism and what is the new phase that's being done across the world when we talk about uh, how the Catholic action is going in the United States and the world. We'll tie in something about this because I, I will not have time to do that today. But we want to end here on a, mes me uh, a message of hope because uh, as everyone here knows, we could throw a bomb into the audience about why this or this is happening in the church and I have this opinion and you have that opinion and this one has that opinion and we could start a big fight about why everything is happening. Uh, but one way that it will be resolved, uh, I believe, through the consecration of Fatima by a pope who is willing to do it and is able to do it. And this is why we don't know what prayer will do it. We don't know what sacrifice will do it or what action will do it. But we should all have hope that just as Our Lady made this warning and promise come true exactly precisely, then so will the, the, the other promise that Our Lady made. In the end, my Immaculate heart, heart will triumph. So I know we have laymen here today, priests, and even some who have the title of bishop. And I would just urge everyone to not be down about this or lose hope because these guys have made some progress. The, uh, the, counter, the revolution, the anti-Christian revolution has made proge progress in this century. But let's have good hope that just as the Our Lady's other prophecies have been fulfilled, that we know for sure today, we know this one will be fulfilled. And by our prayers, sacrifices, and, and actions as we are able to, then uh, we, uh, we, we can have a part in that. And you never know what prayer or what action will, will be the thing that actually turns the tide. I'm going to end with, uh, very briefly with uh, three prophecies that I think uh, should give us great hope, even as the clouds, uh, storm clouds are gathering around the world today. And two of these are private revelations. Uh, the last one is not. Uh, well, the last one is a, a, was, was part of Fatima, I should say, is, a, is of, a, of a more public character. One, the first one, these are from the Tan Book Catholic Prophecy, and uh, were, uh, these individuals were all de de deemed worthy of belief by the church, even though the church doesn't endorse prophecies in all their details. Sister Marianne, a holy nun who lived in the convent of the Ursulines of Blau during the early 19th century. She said, after this time of revolution, she says, such extraordinary events shall take place that the most incredulous will be forced to say, truly the finger of God is here. There shall be a terrible night during which no one will be able to sleep, but these trials shall not last long because no one could endure them. When all shall be lost, when all, excuse me, when all shall appear lost, all will be saved. And then the nursing nun of Bele, given around 1820, at which time it was entrusted to her uh, spiritual advisor, Father Fulgen, said, A saint raises his arms to heaven. He allays the wrath of God. He ascends the throne of Peter. At the same time, the great monarch ascends the throne of his ancestors. All is quiet now. 
Altars are set up again. Religion comes to life again. When I see, what I see now is so wonderful that I am unable to express it. And the third and last prophecy, which I think those two prophecies relate to, is, and it also relates to the triumph over men like Rakovsky and Stalin and Lenin and those funding them, is what, of course, you all know that Our Lady said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. And I, uh, yes, it is the book, uh, it is the book, ta yeah, the, the book is the, the, t from Tan, Yves DuPont, Catholic Prophecy, The Great Chastisement, and I thank you all very much for your kind attention.